Dr. Paul Kalanthi was 36 years old and in his final year as a neurosurgical resident when he was diagnosed with terminal cancer. His life was immediately turned upside down. You see, when he was diagnosed, he learned that there was a major difference between facing death as a doctor and as a patient. Although every day as a doctor, he assisted patients and their families in learning how to move forward and forge a new life or accept the end of life, he wasn't clear at first what his new life would be. You see, his identity, a concept he cherished and used to guide his treatment of patients, was wrapped up in the future he had planned with his wife Lucy and as a neurosurgeon helping others. And when that future slowly disappeared, he had to determine who he could and should be with the time he had left. What if this had happened to you, and you don't know how much time you have left to live, whether you have six months left, one year left, or five years left? What would you do? This was the exact question that dying doctor Paul Kalanthi faced and wrestled with himself. Should he focus more on his personal life and spend the time with his family, friends, and his new child? Should he move into a teaching role? Or should he continue on as a neurosurgeon, which was a major part of his identity? The following are some of his best advice before dying, summarized in his famous memoir, When Breath Becomes Air, so that we can all learn from. Remember, this was a man who was a neurosurgeon that helped his patients face life and death on a daily basis, but now had to face it for himself. Let's go with his best advice. You see, while all doctors treat diseases, neurosurgeons work in the crucible of identity. Every operation on the brain is by necessity, a manipulation of the substance of our cells, and every conversation with a patient undergoing brain surgery cannot help but confront this fact. In addition to the patient and family, the brain surgery is usually the most dramatic event they have ever faced and as such has the impact of any major life event. At those critical junctures, the question is not simply whether to live or die, but what kind of life is worth living. Would you trade your ability or your mother's to talk for a few extra months of mute life? The expansion of your visual blind spot in exchange for eliminating the small possibility of a fatal brain hemorrhage. Your right hand's function to stop seizures. How much neurological suffering would you let your child endure before saying that death is preferable? Because the brain mediates our experience of the world, any neurosurgical problem forces a patient and family ideally with a doctor as a guide to answer this question, what makes life meaningful enough to go on living? I became chief resident my final year, which meant more responsibility and not just on my cases. The bar of success had been raised and conversely, so had the ramifications of failure. Everything I had learned, technically and personally, were wound together. All of it carried a moral weight. The threshold between life and death, that narrow space, required dedication to my skills and to my patients' identities. Whether to proceed with surgery or not dictated an appraisal of both. I was riding high. I was performing my surgical duties with mastery, and my research was highly respected. Surgical departments were vying for my abilities, but the position I wanted was the one right where I was. Stanford was looking for a neurosurgeon, neuroscientist, to study neuromodulation. I knew I was perfect for the role, and they did too. I was starting to get a clear picture of what this world was about and how I fit into it. My friend Jeff, from my early years of residency, wasn't so lucky. Following the death of a patient due to complications from a surgery he'd performed, he took his own life. I understood the guilt he must have experienced, but I also learned that in the battle between life and death, there were other forces at play. We may be the gatekeepers, but we were also human. We have to remember that death was an inevitability, even if we were technically excellent, even if we were morally considerate, sometimes people die, as we all will. Understanding this unwavering fact doesn't mean we are weak or not committed to our responsibilities. It simply means we understand what we are up against and continue to forge our way through despite it. We might not always win, but we keep trying regardless. With this possible regathering of my identity came a remembering of my ideals. I accepted that death was a part of life. I knowing it was something we all would experience. That truth was no more true simply because I had cancer. I was always going to die, but that hadn't stopped me from living. 
Just because the fact of death appeared before I thought it would didn't mean I should stop now either. My meetings with my wife Emma started to surround what my narratives should be. I could follow the path that so many tended to follow, embrace the personal with everything I have left, such as family, friends, and experiences, or I could focus on becoming me again. I'd always assumed I would work as a doctor and scientist for 20 or so years and transition to writer. Without knowing how much time I had left, I didn't know which pursuit of the two was the priority or whether either were the right choice. If I had limited time, I would write. If I had a long-term prognosis, I'd continue on medicine. I couldn't fall back on a prognosis to tell me whether I should work or cherish what I had left. I couldn't use it to decide whether or not to have a child. As a doctor, the statistics helped me formulate a clearer picture of my patients, but for me, the picture was fuzzy. I would have to look deaf in the eye and determine what was important to me, what gave my life meaning, and find a way to try to live that life in whatever way I could. The thing about life-altering illness is that goals or priorities of one day may be different the next. With time seemingly suspended in a finite place, what feels important may suddenly seem otherwise. Death will come, and when it does, it is a singular moment, an isolated moment, but until that day, forming the rest of your life is a journey. You see, Dr. Paul Kalanthi unfortunately passed away from cancer on March 9, 2015, a little under two years from his diagnosis of cancer on May 2013. He never smoked. Although in the beginning he was devastated, he quickly realized that coping meant making a commitment to living his life and values instead of resigning himself to dying. He began treatment and still chose to have a baby with his wife prior to passing away. Having children was something we planned to do, and there was no reason not to continue living and achieving the things we wanted to achieve with whatever time I had left. His daughter Katie was 8 months old when he passed away. What does the story of dying Dr. Paul Kalanthi teach us about life? We will all face hardships and obstacles in life. Sometimes unexpected illnesses and events will change us and our families forever, such as COVID. Life happens and we feel we are no longer the person we once were and our life trajectory is not the same. But through it all, we must maintain our strong sense of identity and understand what makes life meaningful for us, what makes life worth living for us. It is up to us to always decide what makes life meaningful and worth living for us. We must also never take life for granted. We should not procrastinate in terms of our life goals. We never know how much time we have on earth. Every day of life on earth, every day of health and vitality is a gift to us. Please spend this time preciously and please send a prayer to those going through difficult times. Please check out Dying Dr. Paul Kalanthi's book When Breath Becomes Air in the description below. It is filled with much more amazing advice and will truly change the way you see the world, especially if you're going through difficult times yourself. As always, I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Take care.